Throughout my time working in coffee, I've had many conversations with people from all walks of life. Some old, some young, some students, some professionals. And one thing I've learned from all this is that there's something very extraordinary about this simple beverage you and I drink almost every morning, coffee. About a billion people all over the world drink coffee every day, meaning that your morning shares something in its routine with someone in Ethiopia, someone in Indonesia, Guatemala, Honduras, etc. The list goes on and on. People come to coffee for all sorts of different reasons, but rarely because they loved it the first time they tried it, right? I mean, who tries coffee for the first time and just loves it, just black by itself? Most people love the cream and sugar that you add to it. Some people like coffee because of the, the vibe of coffee shops. They love going to study or work on something. Or some people love coffee because of the amazing conversations they've been able to have over a good cup of coffee. I remember being at my grandparents' house when I was six, seven, eight years old, walking downstairs before anybody was awake and see my grandpa with his same old mug, drinking black coffee and reading the newspaper, and admiring him and wanting to be like him one day. The truth is, is that people come to coffee for a variety of reasons. But along the way, I think we've made a mistake there. I think that we've put too much importance on all these communal aspects, which are awesome, but we've kind of put the actual coffee brewing on the back burner. Coffee is seen as something mundane. We do the same thing every week. Coffee is anything but mundane. To illustrate this, I want us to work through a problem together. A problem that many of us face almost weekly, and that is buying coffee at the grocery store. Now maybe you have a local coffee shop that you can go to and you can ask the barista or the person working what coffee might suit your taste or what you might like or not like. But what if you're like most people and you just go to the grocery store and have to buy coffee? You turn down the aisle and are faced with about 300 options with all these words on them and you have no idea what they mean. Should you get the light roast? Should you get the dark roast? Why do these have countries on them? Who knows, should I buy the Starbucks brand? Should I buy the cheap brand? What we end up doing instead is buying a very mediocre coffee, not knowing what it's gonna taste like, not knowing if we're gonna like it, and just recreating that habit day in and day out. I believe that with a little bit of knowledge about how coffee is made, how it is produced, and where we get it from, we can make a much better decision on a weekly basis. So let's start with what coffee actually is. Many people are very surprised that coffee is actually made from a cherry. Okay, so coffee does not grow on the plant in bean form. In fact, if I had to make an analogy, coffee beans are really like the pit of a cherry that you and I eat all the time. They're kind of tart, you wouldn't want to eat them, but you could. We don't see this in the U.S. because coffee's not grown in the U.S., but all over the world, farmers who grow these crops are faced with the difficulties of extracting the beans out of these cherries. Well, how they do that and the differences in the processing methods in which they do that make a huge impact on how the coffee tastes in the end. So there are two primary methods. The first one is the most prominent way and that is called washed. Farmers will take the cherries, they'll put them on these beds and they'll actually wash them with water, removing the pulp, removing the fruit and removing the skin of these cherries. Then they allow these coffee beans to lay out in the fields and dry for about 30 to 40 days. Now, we are isolating the coffee bean in this technique. Therefore, the taste in the cup is unhindered by anything else. It's just the coffee bean. Just the pit of the cherry is influencing the taste. Now, the other prominent method is called natural. And it's just like it sounds. It has very little human involvement. If you were to take, let's say, an apple or just a cherry and put it out in the sun for about 10, 20 days, what would happen? Well, it would start to ferment. It would start to decay. We would say that would look disgusting and it would not be edible anymore. But this is a process that farmers take advantage of. There are bacteria that live on the cherry that when allowed to ferment out in the sun for 10, 20, 30 days, actually metabolize the sugars in the cherry and produce byproducts that influence the taste of the bean. So after 30 days they're drying, the farmers will then remove the fruit, remove the pulp, the skin, and what they're left with is a bean that is still very characteristic of the taste that a washed method might have, but is also influenced by some of this fermentation process. There's some sweetness that rounds out the bitterness. There's kind of a creaminess to it. So if you're looking for maybe a sweeter, less intense cup of coffee, definitely recommend natural process to you. Now we have how we've gotten the beans out of the cherry, but what about where they come from? This is huge. You walk into the store and you see things like Java or Sumatra. Coffee shops really love to put that on bags. Or maybe you see Guatemala or South America or Africa. Well, even though it's the same coffee plant grown in all these different regions, it actually makes a huge difference where they're grown and how that influences the cup. Let's take two origins and juxtapose them. 
Let's take a look at Indonesia and Ethiopia. Indonesia is a mountainous country as well as Ethiopia, but in Indonesia, most coffees are grown at very low altitudes. Starbucks, for example. Starbucks grows almost all of their coffee at low altitude farms in Indonesia. Juxtapose that to Ethiopia, which is also mountainous, but in Ethiopia, most of the coffees are grown at very high altitudes. So what's the difference? At low altitudes, we have lots of oxygen. We have lots of carbon dioxide, right? The gas is more dense there. We know this because when we've gone hiking, it's easy to start out at the beginning, right? There's lots of air, but as you get higher up the mountain, the air starts to become less dense, less oxygen, it's harder to breathe. Now these coffees grown at low altitudes have high turnover rates. And this is why it makes sense for Starbucks to be down there. Lipton makes their tea down there. Folgers makes coffee down there. They have high demands and thus have to make lots of coffee beans. It's fine, I love coffee from Indonesia. It makes a very traditional cup. Now, if you look at Ethiopia, these beans are grown high in the mountains most times. Without oxygen, coffee plants cannot undergo normal respiration. Respiration is just another term for making energy. When we try to make energy without oxygen, it's called anaerobic respiration. This is what happens when we lift weights. Our bodies don't have enough oxygen and thus have to make energy a different route. And they do this by making lactate. Lactate is then broken down into what we know as lactic acid. And you probably heard that lactic acid is what makes your muscles sore. So coffee plants do the same thing. Instead of lifting weights though, they're trying to grow coffee beans. They're trying to grow coffee cherries. So in this case, they don't have enough oxygen, they don't have enough CO2, and so they have to make their energy via anaerobic respiration without oxygen. This produces lactate, which is broken down to lactic acid. Now, lactic acid might not sound like a desirable trait in coffee, but it actually imparts wonderful flavors to your coffee. Lactic acid is known for imparting that same creaminess that we talked about in natural coffees. It imparts um, kind of a fruit-like acidity, maybe a brightness to the cup, but it also kind of balances out that bitterness that you might find in your traditional coffees. So, if we take a step back and look, now we know if we're really looking for a fruity cup of coffee, something that's sweet, not as strong, kind of light in your mouth, then we're gonna go back and we're gonna say, well, I want a natural process, right? Because we know that there's some natural flavors from the fermentation process there. And then we also are gonna look and we say, well, I could choose a coffee from Indonesia, but if I'm looking for something with a little sweetness to it, maybe something from higher elevation, Ethiopia, Kenya, some of those African countries are usually grown at very high elevations. Now we know kind of where we've gotten our coffee from. But what about the roast? We see this all the time. This might be the one we're most familiar with. Light roast or dark roast, or you might see city roast sometime or city plus. Well, all of this is just a scale of really, really light coffee beans to really, really dark, almost black coffee beans. And the difference here is just how long they were allowed to be in the oven, essentially. Roasting coffee just means cooking coffee. And we do this for one really important reason, a chemical reaction that you and I are very familiar with, even if you didn't know it. And this is called the Mallard reaction. The Mallard reaction takes sugars from carbohydrates, your glucose, your sucrose, lactose, and under high heat combines them with amino acids, which are what your muscles are made out of. Coffee beans have amino acids and sugars as well. When this combination occurs under high heat, we, we can see a difference and we can also taste a difference. And we know this. If you eat red meat, this is the exact same reason why you sear your steak before you grill it. You get kind of that, that brown, almost burnt texture to it. You can taste it. You can see it. Well, these are very desirable flavors. It's a good type of burn. Well, the same thing happens with coffee. And the flavors that are produced from this reaction are very desirable. We like these. They're caramelized. They're chocolatey. They're almost bitter without being overwhelming. These are very savory flavors. When you're looking at coffee, dark roasted coffee has allowed the Mallard reaction to go on for longer, therefore having more of those savory notes. Now, dark roasted coffees are great, but we need to understand there's a trade-off here. Because to make those dark roasted flavors that we all love, we've actually taken away from the original taste of the bean. See those beans, we had to use the sugars from the beans. We had to use the amino acids from the beans and use those to make those savory compounds that we like. So if you're looking for a, maybe a really fancy coffee and you wanna taste it for how that bean actually tastes, maybe stick to the lighter roast because you have more of that bean to taste. Now, what about caffeine? We love caffeine, right? It might be the world's favorite chemical. Well, caffeine is great, but caffeine at its most simplest form is actually an imposter. It's actually lying to your body. So every time you drink a cup of coffee, you're actually lying to your body. Caffeine works by tricking your body to think it is a molecule called adenosine. Now, adenosine is really useful to our bodies. We use it for a number of chemical reactions, but one of them is when we're trying to go to sleep. 
When the sun starts to go down, our body sets off a set of chemical reactions that make us sleepy. One of those being releasing adenosine. Adenosine will then go into the brain and bind to its respective receptor. This triggers a set of chemical reactions that will decrease epinephrine in the body, that will decrease adrenaline, right? So we're inhibiting all these excitatory molecules that keep us awake. Well, caffeine is really tricky. Caffeine is chemically similar enough to adenosine to bind to that receptor, but chemically different enough that when it does bind, it doesn't have the same downstream effects. So instead of inhibiting adrenaline, instead of inhibiting epinephrine, it allows the body to keep on making those as if adenosine was never released. So it is true that coffee cannot give you energy. That is true. But the way coffee works, the reason why it makes us feel awake is because it can stop us from getting tired. Now we have a pretty good grasp on what coffee we're buying, right? We can walk into the store and we can say, okay, I want a really sweet cup of coffee. I'm gonna go with a natural and I'm gonna get um, maybe one from Ethiopia and I'm gonna do a medium roast because I don't want too much of the savory stuff, but I also don't want it too acidic. So that's a really good balanced cup. Maybe I want a dark cup of coffee. Maybe I'll go a washed from Indonesia. Maybe I'll have a darker roast. That'd be a great option. But we haven't brewed the coffee yet, right? We have to get it in the cup somehow. So today I want to look at two primary brewing methods, two that kind of represent polar opposites on the spectrum. First being a French press. Now the French press works by a brewing method, what we call total immersion. Now we do this by allowing the coffee and the water to sit with each other for a long amount of time, around five minutes. And what this does is it allows everything that's soluble in the coffee to move over to the water. So what we end up with is a very oily cup of coffee. It gives a great textured coffee, a good body to the coffee. That's what we call kind of a thicker coffee, a well-bodied coffee. Now on the other end of the spectrum, we have what is called a Chemex, or for our purposes, pour-over coffee. Now pour-over coffee is completely different from total immersion. Pour-over coffee means that the second the water hits the ground coffee, it is on a straight shot for the glass, or for in this case, the carafe. Only the most readily available components in the coffee are going to be dissolved into the water. The difference here is that in the French press, we're allowing the coffee and the water to mingle for about five minutes, which is a pretty long time. And the Chemex though, as you can see, as soon as the water hits the grounds, it starts going down into the water. So we are only allowing the coffee and the water to sit with each other for a couple seconds. What this does is it only allows the most readily soluble parts of the coffee to transfer to the water. So what we lose in this method from the French press is that full bodiness, that thickness, that great texture. But what we gain is some clarity. If you're looking for a cup of coffee that's gonna highlight more of the complexities, maybe see more of the flavors, maybe see how the coffee changes when it cools down, a Chemex is gonna show those things off better. Now, these are just two different brewing methods that are able to accent different characteristics of the coffee. We can isolate different variables, different textures, different flavors. And we have so many ways to do this. The options are unlimited. So now you walk into a coffee shop and you're greeted by a huge menu full of tons of items and all in words that are not English. And you don't know what to order. Well, the truth is coffee shops have overcomplicated their menu. The backbone of coffee shop drinks is just espresso and steamed milk. That's it. Now we've added flavors in, we've changed the sizes up, but all you have is espresso and steamed milk. So let's look at these three drinks as an example. Here, you have the smallest drink, also the strongest, the Cortado. Secondly, we have kind of a middle of the road drink, the cappuccino, which is a third espresso, third steamed milk, and a third foam. Over here, you have the largest drink and the least intense drink, the latte, which is two to four ounces of espresso and the rest steamed milk. I hope you can use what you learned here today to go out into your local coffee shop or your local grocery store to buy and make better coffee.